Okay, so I'll, I'll begin now. So the topic for today, we're talking about the lead discovery and development. Particularly, we're going to focus into the machine learning in computational drug discovery. So a little bit about myself. I'm currently head of the Center of Data Mining and Biomedical Informatics, which was started back in 2011. So this year, it would be about 10 year anniversary. And personally, I have published 127 research articles and 17 review articles, as well as five book chapters. Uh, and all of this is made possible by the excellent team member comprising of several PhD students and also young uh, faculty researcher. And so aside from being an associate professor and the head of the Center of Data Mining, I am also part-time YouTuber. So in my spare time, I make YouTube videos on the Data Professor uh, YouTube channel, and also on the second YouTube channel, which is called Coding Professor. And I'm also a blogger. So I blog about data science and also bioinformatics. So aside from doing YouTube, I do blogging on Medium. And so, you know, like in the in traditional day, you might think of blogging as just, you know, like a food blogger, you blog about food, but actually that's not the case for me. I blog about data science. I blog about bioinformatics. Okay, I, I, I also I, I show how you can analyze data, you know, step by step. You know, you don't need to have any background information, so you could just start from scratch. You know, like start from a data set, and then um, I try to write it in simple terms so that anyone can can make use of data science or bioinformatics to analyze data and therefore make data-driven decision, right? Because, you know, like when, when I first started even making YouTube or blog about on Medium, uh, the challenge that I hear a lot from colleagues, from students is they don't know anything about data science. They don't know anything about bioinformatics. And it's such a new field and it's very challenging to, you know, like when you talk to everyone and they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And therefore, I figured it would be nice, you know, if I could, you know, find a way to, to provide some education about this. And looking online, I mean, there, there's not so much resources back then, you know, two years ago. And therefore, that, that started the, the channel. And nowadays, we, we have several, you know, videos, tutorial video. Um, and, and the thing is, it, it helps bridge the gap, you know, like when you publish, you know, researchers, they would talk in technical jargons. And so you, you would read materials and method, but the thing is, it's very difficult to see how the work is done because sometimes the explanation in the paper, it might be done superficially, meaning that the explanation that you get from the paper, it won't be enough for you to reproduce the work. And so this is especially a big hurdle for students wanting to learn about bioinformatics or data science. And so it's a big challenge. And, you know, like um, from blogging and from making YouTube video, I see that a lot of the people, they don't know about Elsevier or Scopus databases. They rely on archive, right? Archive and bioarchive, they are like the preprint. Um, so they rely on free resources that are available. And I don't think they know about various journals that we read about. And therefore, what we are publishing about, it actually doesn't really go to the public, right? So, you know, like all the research that we've done, I mean, if we ask the practitioner in the field, let's say we talk to a, a random data scientist working at SCB, they probably won't know that we use out random forest to make a prediction on the bioactivity. And so, and if you look at the data from Scopus, most of the paper, like for example, from my own research group, they're not read by a lot of the, the general masses. So maybe it's read by only a handful of researcher in the field. And so it might get some publication. I mean, it, it might get some citation, but it's not getting the attention that we hope it would, right? But then I noticed that when, like, for example, if I make a YouTube video or if I blog one article, um, like recently I, I read an article about how to master scikit-learn for, for doing data science. And so that article received about 10,000 views in, in about a month uh, versus an article that I would publish, maybe that one would received about maybe a couple 
hundred in a year. Okay. So it, it really depends. And, and also like, you know, like not a lot of people get to see the work that you're doing. And therefore um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the common things that we hear is that most of the paper goes to the shelves, right? In Thai we say, right? it goes to the shelves and it's never been read. And so, you know, as, as a researcher, we want our research to be, to have an impact to the general public. And if the public don't know, then how, Will they be able to make use of that? It's, therefore, I think this is a big challenge, you know, to to make research and also to communicate about research. And so, in, in this presentation, actually, I, I recorded the the first talk, and I uploaded that one as the the very first video on my YouTube channel. So, if you go back and have a look, it's actually coming from this course I taught over at Sirirat uh, in this department. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at disease. Okay, when you think of disease, what do you think of? So if you open up the Cambridge Dictionary, you will see that diseases are the illness of people, animal or plants. So plant can have disease, okay? Animals and people have disease. We are familiar with that, but plants as well. And so illnesses of these are caused by malfunction or it could cause by external factor like infection. Okay, and so all of this will have a severe effect on the health of the living organism instead of being by accident, right? And so the malfunction or the undesired uh, pathophysiologic condition could be remedied by drugs, okay? And so drugs are called biological or chemical entity. So a drug can be both a compound and it could also be a protein or peptide as well. And so if it is a peptide or protein, we call it biological. And so if it's coming from compounds, like small molecule, we call it the chemical entity. Or we could call it small molecule or compounds, or you know, generally we, we refer that to them as drug. So biological entity could also include antibodies, right? And chemical entity, as I mentioned, include the small molecule, okay? And so typically in drug discovery setting, you would want to, find a drug that will be able to interact with the target protein. And so in a traditional simplistic drug discovery system, you have a single target protein where you want to find a small molecule or a antibody that will be able to interact with the target protein and exert the modulation, okay? And so the modulation could either be inhibition or it could be activation, okay? But most likely uh, for a lot of the disease, we want to inhibit the function of the protein, okay? So therefore we try to find a molecule that could bind to the target protein, okay? And so <clears throat> drug target network, as you can see here, if you look at the broad concept of bioinformatics, what I've mentioned to you in the previous slide, it happens here in the drug target network. So let me try to draw an image. Okay, so we have, okay, uh, can you see this? Okay, you, you can see, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Okay, so let me draw some node. Um, so each circle will represent a protein. Okay, let's say we have protein A, B, C, and we could say a protein A and B interact. Actually, we let's make it into another color. Make that a different color, red. Like light pink, okay. And we have protein D and we have E.
Let me draw some more. Right, so you know, this is a biological network. Okay, so this is a biological network and each period that you see, let's say that they represent a protein. And therefore they are protein, protein interaction. Okay, and so if you look at this image, which one do you think are the most important protein? Can you guess? A. Which of these? Hmm? I think A, Ajahn. Right, why do you think A? Because it has many connections with other protein. Okay, right. So when you see that it's most connected, and, and actually that's the fact when they're doing biological network analysis is that A is like the center, it's at the center of the biochemical pathway, right? But, but you know that the tricky part about it is it might or might not affect the disease that you're interested in. So you, you also have to consider, okay, like what are the F and Gs and the B and the E and you know, like, or D and C and how are they involved in this particular pathway? Or how about I, J, K? They're, separately on an island, right? It doesn't affect this pathway. So let's say that we know that A, like for example, the P53 is, is similar to A, because P53 is involved with another, you know, if you, anal if you look at a lot of paper related to P53, they're at the center as well. They're, they're called the hub. They're at the hub, they call it the hub. Okay, and so these hub protein are quite essential for the disease. But the thing is, if you find a drug that will inhibit this particular protein, it's not a good idea. Do you know why? Because there might be side effects, right? And therefore we have to find which, which of these node can we inhibit without side effects. And therefore, we have to find the rate limiting step. Rate limiting step. Now, like which protein is the rate limiting step? Which one? Like, if you look at the pathway, you have to analyze the role of each protein, and you, you have to know how they each function separately. And let's say that pro they catalyze some reaction, okay? So protein could be enzymes or it could just simply be a receptor. Okay, but so enzymes, let me change the, so enzymes, so enzymes catalyzes a reaction, right? Right, so you have the substrate and then the enzyme will make it into a product. Okay. And so if we, let's say that for example, the aromatase, we have aromatase. This is an example. And it converts androstenedione. dione. To estrogen. And then we know that high level of estrogen leads to breast tumor. So therefore, what do we want? We want to reduce 
the level of estrogen. And how can we reduce the level of estrogen? We have to inhibit the aromatase. Okay, and how do we inhibit aromatase? We need aromatase inhibitors. And the thing is the aromatase, it is a, it's at the rate limiting step. And therefore aromatase will be a good target protein. So the thing is, if you look at the pathway here, not all protein can be, a, can be a target protein where we want to find a drug to inhibit. So based on this network, we have to analyze them one by one. Okay, and we have to look at the, the side chain effect because everything is like a domino. If we inhibit this, we might have influence on this one and this one. And let's say that, let me draw another, Let's say that F might interact with other protein of their own, right? And B may have other protein that it also interact with. Oh no. Okay. So we have to be careful, you know, like if we inhibit this, we might also influence this pathway and we might also influence this pathway as well. So the thing is, how can we stop this pathway with minimal side effect, right? Because when, when we encounter side effect, there is downstream effect, right? You inhibit A, but you also cause B to malfunction. You also cause F to malfunction. So there must be a trade-off. It, it, it's not just inhibit A and solve, problem are solved. Okay, you have, to, you have to look at the pathway. Does it influence other proteins in the family as well? And if it does, it might cause side effects, okay? And I'm going to show you in the slide, there's also other terms such as off-target binding. And the term of poly pharmacology. Okay, so briefly right now, I could tell you is off-target binding is, it happens when, um, okay, this is the protein, protein. Protein, and we have, the compound. Okay, so ideally you wanna have it interact and it will cause some effects, right? Therapeutic effects, hopefully. But the thing is, it's not that simple because your compound may may interact with another protein let's call this protein a and let's call this protein b okay And therefore it will have side effects. It's off-target binding. Okay, it's, it's just, let me move it below. Off-target binding.
And this is what we expect, right? Expected binding. But sometimes things go unexpected and they might bind and it might cause side effects. However, it's not always a bad thing because it might also cause a new therapeutic effect. And therefore, if it happens, this new therapeutic effect will be, we call it drug reposition, repos drug repurposing. Or sometimes we call it drug repositioning. Which leads to a novel drug indication. Or in simple term, we teach old drug new tricks. Okay, so maybe I could color this. Target binding, this is expected binding. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, there's a question so far. So this is addressing the topic of polypharmacology and off-target binding, which essentially are related, as you can see. Okay, so this is off-target binding. So the thing is, it's supposed to bind this, protein A, but then the compound binds to protein B. And then it could lead to a side effect, but in other circumstances, okay, this is scenario A. Okay, scenario A. And scenario B, right? So if it happens to give bad effect, it you could call it a side effect. But if give rise to good therapeutic effect, yeah, you could call that is serendipity, right? Serendipity is when you find something miraculous by accident. Serendipity. Okay, you find you find a new drug by accident and a popular example of this is the discovery of penicillin by alexander fleming so the the, the story goes that he went on a vacation or so and over the long weekend he discovered that the petri dish has some inhibition zone and then he tried to investigate what, what's the reason behind the inhibition zone. And then he discovered that they, the bacteria, they express this, um, I mean, the fungi, they express this uh, penicillin. They're, they're producing penicillin compounds. And therefore, they, they discovered antibiotic. And so this is serendipity. Okay. So let's go back. So I have explained already about... Uh, all of this, okay. Let's go to the next page. Drug discovery. So drug discovery process is a very long process taking about 10 to 15 years. And the failure rate is pretty high at about 90%. And it's very costly because it takes almost like 2 billion US dollar to take one single drug into the market. And so that means that it takes you know, 10 year of research just to figure out whether a compound will work, whether it will have side effects, whether it will have, you know, like uh, what, what expected effects in the human body, the pharmacokinetic property. So all of that takes 10 to 15 year and 2 billion US dollar because, you know, like thousands of compounds will be in the clinical trials and only a handful, okay, like out of, 
hundreds or thousands, only a few, right? Like two to three will pass clinical trials. And so this is explained by the drug discovery process. Okay, so if you look at it here, okay, let me see if I can, okay, I can draw on here. Okay, nice. Let me, okay, so if you look at here, the, It started with the, the target discovery, right? As I mentioned already, you have to analyze your biological pathway in order to identify proteins that you think might be a good candidate to serve as the target. Okay, so that is the first part, the target discovery. And once you have identified protein that could serve as a, a target, then you wanna find compounds that could bind to it. Right. So I, I forgot to mention that when you identify that from here, from the uh, from the earlier drawing that I made, let's say that we identify, let's say protein E. Okay, we don't want A because it might have side effect. Right. Let's say that we identify protein E as a good candidate for um, serving as a target protein. And then what do we do? We, let's say, say that we try to do a knockout experiment where we genetically engineer a mouse or uh, E. coli to not express a particular gene, right? So that particular gene that we identified. And then we wanna see what it causes to the phenotypic property, okay? If it has any effect on the phenotypic property. And if the knockout had an effect, and then we would, know for sure that it is a good candidate, okay? And therefore we will try to find a compound that will be able to modulate, okay? Modulate mean it could inhibit or it could uh, activate the protein, right? Um, so we do that by performing discovery screening. And then if we do it experimentally, um, actually your department also have equipment to do the high throughput screening, right? So there is high throughput and uh, and also typical is the low throughput screening. And so how would you do it? Let me draw an image. Okay, so what you typically have is a micro titer plate. And then you have many wells, right? And then for each well for the pipette, I'm not sure if I draw it properly in a pipette. You would put the reagent, okay, of your the protein. So the protein will go to all dish, I mean, to all wells, okay? So all of the wells here will have the proteins. Let's say I indicated by yellow. Okay, so all wells will have the protein and then we will add the drug. We will put different drug into it. We will add drug A, we'll add drug B, we'll add drug C. So I represent it by the different color, D, E, et cetera, okay? And therefore each well, you will have a combination between the target protein and the compound. Okay, and then we're gonna measure the, the readout. So normally it will be the fluorescence. And then we convert this into either, you know, the units like KI or IC50 or the percent binding. So we collectively refer to this as the bioactivity. Okay, so this is screening. Okay, and screening could be high throughput. Or it could be low throughput. 
Okay, so it depends on the facility. And therefore, from hundreds or even thousands of the testings, we will get the IC50 and KI out of that. Okay. And so it is the measured activity, either the binding, the KI, or the IC50, is going to go to the database. Let me show you. No. Chembo. Okay, database such as Chembo. Okay, so this database contains the biological activity of you know, any proteins and any compounds that you're interested in. Let's say that I'm interested in aromatase. I type in aromatase. I go to the target. Okay, and then I get to see the targets on the menu bar here. You, you have the target, you have the compound. So I click on the target and then you're gonna see that there's two data available, right? For the homo sapiens, human, and also for the rats. And then you're gonna see that there are over 2000 compounds right here, uh, 2,986 compound that are available. Okay, so there are data about 2,900 compound against the aromatase, okay? Uh, for the human and also for the rat, about 211, okay? So if you click on the data, so you have 5,000 record uh, for, so you have 2,900 compound, but then you have 5,000 record. It means that for each compound, it could mean that you might have the bioactivity for KI or IC50. Okay, so each compound could be tested for IC50, or it could also be tested for other activity unit. It could be percent binding, it could be IC50, it could be KI, right here it says KI, and this is IC50, and this is the percent binding. Okay, and you see the unit here, percent. And then this is the, the bioactivity value. And so if it's KI, the lower, the better, but if it's inhibition percent, the higher, the better, okay? So inhibition, the higher number is good, but then the data for inhibition percent is not reliable. So for any type of analysis that we, we do when we build a prediction model, we use IC50 or we use KI, okay? because they are more reliable. They are kinetic constants, okay? So they're obtained from multiple measurements. Let me draw an image. So you have IC from zero to 100. And if you have 50% inhibition, right? It's right here. And then you want to do a kinetic curve measurement. This is the concentration in molar. So you're doing it, you know, from multiple endpoints here. You're doing multiple measurements. And then you want to know where is 50% right here. So it's actually corresponding to here. I see 50 is right here. And so this is the concentration right here. So what is the value here? Let's say it's 10 micromolar. And let's say that you have another compound. Let's say another compound is like this, right? Because we measure it by different endpoint here, right? And so the 50%, for this one is right here. And so the value is, low, is smaller. Let's say it, it, it is about 100 nanomolar. And therefore the purple color is a better inhibitor because it has lower concentration. Okay, so let's say we call this compound A and you call this 
compound B. So compound with the lower concentration that will elicit 50% inhibition will be the better compound. Okay, so here you can see that compound A provides 100 nanomolar, right? Because uh, compound B, you need, you need how many times more? 100 times more to provide the same inhibition effect. Okay, so this is how you get the IC50. And so IC50 is a constant from multiple measurements. Okay, but when you're doing, when you're looking at the percent binding right here, it is obtained from a single measurement. Okay, and it's not from a curve like this. So therefore this is not so reliable. And therefore KI and IC50, they're both obtained from this kind of kinetic and therefore they're more reliable, okay? And so back to the Chambo database here in a typical experiment, like when we do a, a model building, we would collect the data that you see. So 5,000 record would be downloaded into the computer. Okay, so we would download the entire, you know, 5,392 into the computer, okay? So I'm gonna go back to the slide so that you will see in more detail in just a moment. Okay, so okay, let me try to find the laser. Mm. It's not here. Oh no, okay. Okay, so each, at each step, you can see that it takes time, right? For target discovery, it could take two to three years. Discovery and screening, it could take maybe half a year to one year. And typically, you know, high throughput screening together with virtual screening, okay? And you might hear the term molecular docking. Uh, elite optimization, okay? That, that's like essentially the, the course is about lead discovery and development, right? So for lead, it means that you have identified the hit. Okay, so the hit will be identified from the virtual screening and also from the high throughput screening in step two. You will see at the bottom here, uh, screen. Oh no. Okay, so this one. This is the hit. Hits will be identified at this stage, okay? And so once you get the hit, hit means that they are compounds that provide, you know, relatively good inhibition, but they're not the best, okay? So you want to improve on the hit and therefore you will take the hit and then you will optimize the hit by maybe adding additional functional group to the molecule. And that is what they call lead optimization. Okay, so you're taking a hit and then you're making it into a lead. And then you take the lead and then you optimize the structure of the lead. And so that might take a lot of um, synthesis. So you might synthesize a library of compound that looks like the hit. Okay, but like maybe it has a, a single functional group addition. So let me draw some picture. Okay. Uh, but before I draw, is it clear or? I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. I found that the rate limiting step for the every uh, every biological um, pathway is the uh, same. Or what would be the best rate limiting step for the the for the target? Right. So the thing about the rate limiting step is that if you look at the let's say that the um, so you, you have to correlate the, the rate limiting step together with the phenotype. So I, I use an example of the aromatase enzyme. It is a rate limiting, it's at the rate limiting step of the conversion from the androgen to the estrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. in the creation of estrogen, if you look at the pathway, there are so many proteins involved. Okay, so we have aromatase, we have 17 beta dehydroxy, uh, steroid dehydrogenase, 17 beta HSD, 17, what is it, beta hydroxy, steroid 
dehydrogenase. Um, they also have steroid uh, sulfatase. It means that it adds and removes the sulfur group to the estrogen. Um, so let's say that there's about four to five protein in that pathway in the creation, in the synthesis of estrogen. But then if you look at the pathway, you know, each enzyme, it will contribute to a certain percentage of the total estrogen that are produced. And so the bulk, I'm, I'm not sure about the actual percentage. So let's say that roughly, so the majority are produced by the aromatase. Let's say it accounts for 70%. Okay, so... If you could select any enzyme in the entire pathway to serve as a target protein, and you found that aromatase um, it encompasses about 70% of the production. And if you could inhibit one protein and you will reduce the production of estrogen by 70%. Okay, but, but the thing is, estrogen is not entirely bad. Okay, it's, it's good but not in high amounts. So the goal is not to eliminate totally the production of estrogen, but the goal is to prevent the overproduction of estrogen. And so even if we inhibit aromatase, we still have other pathway, uh, we still have other proteins in the pathway for synthesizing estrogen. So we know that, okay, if aromatase and, uh, what, takes about 70%, it produces about 70%, Therefore, we have about 30% left that are still being produced, but 30% is not overproduction. So that is okay. And therefore, if we find inhibitors to inhibit the aromatase, then we will eliminate the overproduction. And the overproduction normally leads to the tumor mass uh, accumulating in the breast. Okay, great question. Yeah, Dan, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so uh, I was about to draw the, um, the lead optimization, right? Let's see, if I have other drawings before. <clears throat> okay, I have this, let me copy this. Okay, I made this drawing a long time ago. Let's go back. Okay, copy, paste. Let me duplicate it, okay. So let's say that this is a lead. And so I'm gonna generate many alternative or I call it analogs. Okay, I'm gonna generate a lot of analogs, okay. And let's say for this one, I'm going to Add an OH here. Make the color red. Okay, so I'm making it OH at the terminal here. And let's say I'm creating another analog. But instead of being OH there, I will add OH here. Okay, and create another analog right here. Okay, so in this simple example, I generated hydroxy group at different positions of the molecule, okay? So because the thing is, uh, let's say I don't know which one will give a good result. And let's say that originally, let's say this gives 10 micromolar. If I make this, it becomes, okay, let me, okay, this makes it to become um, one micromolar. This makes it to become uh, 500 micromolar. This becomes 50,000 micromolar. Okay, so based on this result, okay, this is the bio Activity. Let me make it bigger. Okay, so the yellow highlight is the bioactivity. Okay, so based on the analogs, 
you know, analog A, B, C, which one do you think is a good way to continue? So the original is here. Let's say this is a hit. So this is the identified hit. Okay, but then I, I made the hit to become a lead, right? It serves as a lead. Okay, and the analogs here is because I'm performing lead optimization. I want to optimize the lead. Okay, can you, can you tell me which compound? Is it compound A? Is it B or is it C? Let's call it A1. Yeah, in the actual paper, they normally do that. They call this A, and then they call this A1, A2, A3. Right, it's compound A, compound A1, A2, A3. And you know, in, in, the, in the typical paper, they might have up to like A20 or A30. Okay, can you guess which one? The lower, the better. The lower value, is, it means better activity. A1. A1, perfect, yes, A1, because the activity decreased from 10 micromolar to become one micromolar. And therefore it means that, okay, if I add an OH group here at this position, it's farther away from this, right? And, and it might have more of a, uh, good electro, uh, what do we call it, a negativity of, of the compound, okay? So it really boils down to the push-pull effect, the localization or delocalization of the electron, okay? Because each OH here are placed at different position, to the left, I mean, to the right, to the left, and to the bottom, okay? And also, you know, even this part could be modified as well. Even the ring here could be modified, okay? It could be a triple fan, like a, uh, we call it indo ring, right? You can make it other substitution as well, okay? And so this is the field of medicinal chemistry. Medicinal chemistry. And so it's when you, you modify the R group. You know, in the typical paper, they will, they will highlight the color of the molecule maybe like that. Okay, so they call it the R group. Okay? These are the R group, the colored red. R group, R group, okay. So it's quite similar to amino acid, you know, if amino acid, you know, amino acids contain the alpha carbon. Right, and it has the amine group, it has the carboxylic acid, it has the R group, and it has the hydrogen, right? So all amino acids are the same like this, but they differ, they differ with the R group, right? So R group here is different. I mean, it's the same R group, but it is added to the different position and therefore they give different activity. And if you translate this, this ligand, it normally goes to bind with a target protein. Let me find you a picture here, like here. Oh no, this is the prediction. Um, let me find another image right here. No, right here, yeah. So the, the molecule, it binds to a target protein, okay? And so what we do in, in computational prediction is we want to predict if it has this structure, what is the activity? We want to predict the activity. And so therefore we call it the bioactivity prediction. Okay, so actually I made this application as a tutorial on my YouTube channel. Let's go back to the slide. Okay, so actually this presentation will be provided as a PDF 
So I'm not sure if all of you have received it already. Already received all. Already? Okay, very good. Okay. So this is quite similar to the previous slide, but then it's a more concise way. So the thing is you're going from a million compound. You're going from a million to one. So you have thousand, you have millions of possibility during the hit generation, during the high throughput screening. So the thing is, we don't know everything. And so we have to screen millions of compounds. Let me go back to writing. You know, like if I teach in class, I like to draw on the whiteboard and therefore I draw here as well. So drug discovery, you can think of it as kind of like a funnel. Right, you put in a million compound during your screening. And let's say that we identified 10 hits. And then from the 10 hits, let's say that we, we try to make it into 100 of leads. No, no, let's say 10 hits and then we get 10 leads, right? But then the lead, we have to generate the we have to do optimization, lead optimization. There, maybe we, we could get thousands of molecule. And therefore from that thousand, you know, it comes down to maybe 10. And then we do some experimental testing. And out of 10, let's say that one compound give promising activity. So it's kind of like this, you know, with all experiment, you're, you're starting with large number and then you're screening it down to only a few compounds, okay? So you have to rely on sheer quantity in order to make drug discovery work because a lot of things is due to uncertainty as well. Because, because we do know how it works, right? We might know the mechanism of action, but to get the exact molecule that will be able to inhibit the protein, um, I mean, not everything is known, you know, that we could design it from scratch, okay? But computational approach provides a lot of assistance in that manner. All right, so you, you can see that we perform virtual screening and we get like a, a good starting point. And then after that, we have to explore the chemical space. And then after that, we perform the lead optimization, right? All right, but you know, the thing is we don't only want a compound that will be able to inhibit the target protein optimally, but we also needed to have favorable pharmacokinetic property, okay? So it need not only inhibit the target protein, but it should have the following pharmacokinetic property. It means that it should absorb in the stomach. It should be permeable to the gut wall and to the cell wall and also to the blood brain barrier if it's a neurological drug. It must also be metabolically stable, right? That it could also be uh, metabolized properly in the cytochrome P450 in the liver. And also it must be non-toxic. And most importantly of all, it should be synthesizable, right? So it, it must not be too difficult for the medicinal chemist to synthesize the compound. And so to achieve all of this desirable property, it's kind of like a multi-objective optimization, okay? So if, if I ask you a question, like if you want to buy a mobile phone, can you share with me what characteristic are you looking for? If you buy this, you know, this phone, what should be the characteristic? Can I hear from both of you? Whoever can start? How about Jack? Jack, would you like to start? I get a green piece, huh, Jan? If you want to buy a mobile phone, Okay, so what are the requirements that you look for when you buy a phone? Buy a phone. Yeah. Buy a phone. Yes, yes, yes. A cell phone, yeah, a cell phone or a mobile phone. I mean, because, you know, there's so many, many types, right? There's Android, there's iOS, 
And even with Android, there's so many brands, right? And there's so many features, so many functions. You know, what, what, what are your requirements? Do you have something to have a checklist or even the budget, right? Hima, you go first. Okay, um, I, for me, I think uh, it might be user friendly. And I, for, right now I use the Android, so okay. I don't, I, I prefer user friendly and also the affordable price. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm concerned about the camera. Uh, mm -hmm. The camera should be the good uh, the solution. That's all. Okay. Price, camera, those are your two important factors. Anything else? That's all. Mm -hmm. I user, okay. uh, have to be user friendly. User friendly, okay. So there's three. Okay. I, I, believe, about Jack? I believe in man. You believe in the brand. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I think you're going with the Apple, right? I, I see. Yes, yes. 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 I believe I bought Apple. Okay. Any other reason? No, I, I, I believe, I believe in the company brand. Okay. So let me draw an image of that. Okay. So we have the brand. We have the user friendly. And then we have what? Um, camera. Good camera. And what else, Hemar? Price, Ajahn. Price. Price. Good price. Competitive price. Okay, so you have, we have, how about the spec? Let's say, okay, another one would be the tech spec, right? If I draw into a the node, this is a node, okay. okay. This is a pentagon, okay. Okay, let's say that for for Jack, it's only one factor. It's hard to draw with only one line. Let's see, I make this visualization, okay? One for each of you. Okay, for Heymar. Okay, so Heymar is the user friendly. How, how would you give it? Let's say from a score of five, how many? Zero to five. Four, I think. You give it a four, okay. And how about the good camera? Five. You give it a five. How about the price? Uh, four. Let's say, let's say, um, let's say that higher value of price mean it more expensive, and the lower is mean, uh more cheaper. Okay, so three. Three. Okay. How about the brand? For me, right. Mm hmm. Uh, two. Two. Okay. And how about the tech? The spec. Should be five. Should be five, okay. You know, like, it should be like this. No, no. So this is two, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. This is three, right? One, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Okay. And so let me connect the dots. This is a radar plot. It's a way of visualizing. Maybe I'll just draw it with this thing. Okay, so this radar plot is for Hamar for buying a phone. 
And how about for uh, Jack? Can you let me make the drawing again. Two, three, four. Okay, so Jack is a uh, brand. I think you give it a five. Five, right? yes. And you sir, Philly, uh, three. Three, okay. Good camera, three. Three, Price. three. Price, uh, three. Huh? Okay. Take uh, five, four, 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 four. Four, oh, four, four. or five, right. Let's say four, no? And then we make it like this. So this is your visualization. So it's a simple, you know, like radar plot. We call this the radar plot. And let's say that we compare the two. It's a, it's a nice way of uh, comparing the visualization, right? You could even adapt this for your own. Oh, no. Okay, the same, yeah. So we can see that uh, for Haymar, um, not so much emphasis on the brand, but she wants more user-friendly and good camera. But for uh, for Jack, it's more into the brand and tech spec, right? Yeah, so we can see very easily how, you know, each factor influences the decision. Okay, so your decision is to buy a phone. Okay, and the factor that influences your decision are you know, brand tech spec for Jack and user-friendly and camera for uh, Haymar. And let's say that we already know the specification, the filter, okay? So this is like the filtering criteria for each of you in buying a camera, I mean, for buying a mobile phone. Let's say that I have a thousand phones and I will try to fit it into this criteria, okay? And therefore from a thousand, I might be able to get Starting from a thousand, I may be able to get, let's say, um, 20 phones for Haymar. And let's say from, for Jack, maybe I could get from, I could get two. And the reason is because for Jack, you specify it to be iPhone. You, you already specified the brand. Let's say you, you want only the iPhone. Therefore, you're limited to either getting a big or a small iPhone, right? Right? And the price could be either a big or a small iPhone, right? The mini iPhone or it would be like the bigger iPhone, right? Yes. The six inch or the, what do you call it? The four inch iPhone? Yeah, but for uh, Himar, you're, you don't specify the brand. Therefore, it could be any brand. And good camera, I mean, there's so many brands having good camera, right? And user-friendly, right? There's many, many brands as well. And therefore you will get maybe much more. It, it could be even more than 20. It could be like maybe 50, okay? So based on the different criteria for the filtering, you will see that you will get the end result to be quite different, okay? And so the filtering criteria that you see here is kind of like the model. It's kind of like the threshold when we analyze the data, okay? And so the thousand of phone that you see here, it could be the molecule. Thousands of molecule, and then we get 20 molecule. And your decision here, will dictate how we turn a thousand into 20, how we turn a thousand into two. Okay, so if we take an example here is that instead of it being from Haymar and becoming from Jax, let's say that this is a target protein, um, part of the kinase family, let's say. And let's say that this is a protein part of the uh, cytochrome P450. Okay, so different protein family will have different requirements, right? Because different enzyme, different protein will have different property. And therefore we have to be careful to, uh, to set the threshold differently, okay? Based on the analysis of the data. And therefore, if we try to pull back to the multi-objective optimization that we see here, okay? So it's very, it, it really depends on the protein that you're studying, okay? And that you try to balance between many factors that it should bind well, number one, it should bind to the target protein, but it should also be safe. Okay, so like with the example of you selecting the phone, right? You should have a relatively good camera, but it should be easy to use, right? 
So it, it, it comes with a trade-off, okay? So the tricky part is how do we get, you know, the best possible? So we have to optimize it by, uh, in, in terms of multiple uh, parameters, okay? So actually, I think I will skip a lot of slides. It's because I've explained many in the form of the drawing, okay? So in the creation of a new compound, where do we come up with the inspiration for a new compound? If you could guess, it's probably from nature, right? We look to nature to find, not, not, not the nature journal, but we look to nature, right? To the environment. Um, green tea, right? It has ketogen. Um, curcumin, right? In, in the food, in the spice. Um, in chili, we have capsaicin, right? Um, in ginger, we have what? I think they call it gingenoid, is it? And so, what, what, what was it? Ginseng no sai. Oh, ginseng no sai. Yeah, ginseng. And I'm ginseng, ginseng and ginger. Oh. Yeah, ginseng no sai is from, for the ginseng, right? Yeah, but there are several uh, ginseng no sai compounds as well. And it really depends on the soil, right? What country it coming, it's coming from. And the mineral in the soil will give rise to the different type of uh, ginseng uh, that you get. Even for the cannabis that we see, right? When it's grown at different altitude, grown in different soil, different uh, temperature, it gives rise to different composition of the, um, I'm not sure what it's called. It's the THC or something, right? Uh, the component of the cannabis. So it really depends on the environment, on the soil, right? So all of that is nature inspired, okay? And so, Another part is once we're inspired by nature, we could use it as a hit, right? And then we generate a lot of lead compound. And then we try to optimize the compound by doing lead optimization in order for us to find a, you know, a promising drug. And so in, in computer, we could perform what is called com compound enumeration. Um, have any of you played Legos before? Lego, you know Legos, right? Oh, you know Lego? This kind of block. Not tiny, the three dimension. Yes. Right, and it might have, you know, four in the block. So the Lego, you, you could build many things with Legos, right? Same thing with the compound, as I've drawn here. You add a functional group to it, like OH, and you add it to different position, you will get a new compound, right? You could even reshuffle. We could take this, let's see. We could take this and put it here. Put it here. We could reshuffle it, right? And then we get a new compound. So the chemical formula is the same, but it's a different molecule, right? It's a different molecule, right? It contains the same number of atoms. It contains the same element, but it's connected differently. Therefore, it is a different compound. Okay, so you could generate this like a Lego building block. You could move it around, you could connect it in different way, and then you will get a new compound. And so they call this the compound enumeration. It's using concept from uh, mathematics you know, or, or similar to, I'm not sure if you have heard of combinatorial library before. You have building block, right? Let's say I have a building block. Let's say I have a core structure ABC. Core structure is kind of like here. Let me color it for you. Yellow color is this core. And let's say that oxygen containing is in pink and nitrogen containing is in the blue cyan color. So you will see that 
I could move around and the property changes, right? So A, B, C could be the, the core. This could be A. Let me draw it um, orange. Let me zoom in. This is A. This is A. And let's see, if I take this and I convert it into Um, let me see. Put it back here, delete this, and I'll draw. I'll draw this one. And I'll draw purple color here. So this become B, scaffold B. Scaffold B, okay. So scaffold B is this one. Scaffold A is the yellow one. Right, and I could draw another scaffold for uh, C. Maybe it's another different scaffold, okay? So these are the substructures. These are the scaffolds, okay? So when you form a drug, when you design a molecule, you have the scaffold along with the substructure. And it's not only, not only one, but it's multiple. And then you could imagine that the substructure could be reorganized, it could be reshuffled, okay? It could be you know, modified to become an H here, OH. Okay, and this could be a fluorine if you want, okay. So this is li uh, ligand or compound enumeration, okay. Compound enumeration, like the term enumerate. Like a Lego building block, you take A and B and C and you, you mix it in different combination in different connection. Let me call this one, two. And this is three. This is one. No, no. This is one, this is two, three. But then I made change. So this is three prime because I added the H here. This is three, this is uh, one, this is two. But then I moved the position, right? I moved two from here to become here and here. So let's call this two prime. So these two are the same. So I call it two prime. Original is two. I move it from here to become here. So I call it two prime. Uh, it was originally three, right? But I added a H, so it become three prime. And this is H, I mean, this is O, this is O, so it's three, three. So this is one, I added an F here, so this become one prime. So you got, I modify the structure, right? And I modify the scaffold. Originally I had A, but I modify it to be B. Right, so you're, you're having scaffold and substructure, but then you have different components and then you're creating new molecule. Okay, so this is compound enumeration, okay? It's creating a new molecule based on the same building block, but you're just organizing it in different way. And so what I told you is the compound enumeration is actually reported in a paper by the group of J. J. L. Raymond. 
So he took molecules up to 13 atoms right here. And then he reshuffled the atoms, you know, so that they will form a new molecule. And he got 977 million possible molecule. And if he takes 17 atoms and then he reshuffled them in different combination, he gets 166 billion possible molecule. So this is 10 to the 11th power, right? So by 13, this is what it, it, it's mean. Let me, let me show you. So what I have right here in this example is I have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Okay, this is perfect. 17 atoms. Okay, so if I have 17 atoms, and if I connect it in different way, and I use different element, I could use nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, then I will get about 166 billion compound right here. Okay, let's go back to the next slide, chemical space. Okay, so chemical space is just a simple way to refer to all the possible compound in a universe. Okay, so if there's 166 billion, then this is the chemical space. So it represents all possible compounds that could be created. But then in the actual experimental uh, databases that we see, um, the number is not that high, right? So let, let, let us go to a database like Chemble. Let me show you this one. Let's go to the first page. You could even follow along. You could type in to Google Chemble. So you see from Chemble here that it has how many? 2.1 million compounds. Okay, so this is available to us, 2.1 million compounds. And there are 14,000 target. I cannot zoom in or can I? Yeah, I can zoom in now. Oh no. Okay, so there are 2.1 million compounds. And I mentioned to you that this is 166 billion. Okay, so you, you can see that what we are able to access right now is quite limited, considering that there are, you know, like 100 billion or compounds that could be synthesized, but that, that are not yet synthesized. So 166 billion is just the hypothetical compound. Okay, so that is a lot of potential that we haven't yet tapped into, okay? And this is the drug discovery toolbox. So they are all of the tools that are available for this discovering a new drug. So experimentally, the experimental method are shown at the top part. So we could do combinatorial chemistry. We could synthesize a lot of compound by chemical library. Um, I mean, to, to get chemical libraries, and then we could, you know, all of the available compounds are called the chemical space uh, in terms of visualizing it. And then we have hydrochloric screening in order to identify which of the compound when tested against the target protein of interest, which one show promising activity. Okay, and then we have property filter, as I, I shown you, to you the example about buying a phone right, using the different criteria. So it's same here, property filter. Uh, computational chemistry is another field where they use quantum mechanics to investigate the uh, effect of electron on the molecule structure. And in the field of data science, machine learning, well, they could use machine learning in order to build prediction models, um, particularly QSAR and proteochemometric are making use of machine learning in order to create prediction models that could predict the biological activity of the compound. Okay, and then we have molecular modeling, which is pretty much just visualizing the protein structure. 
And then we have molecular dynamic and molecular docking, which is to investigate the dynamic of the protein structure uh, using a special software called molecular dynamic. And then we have molecular docking, which is to figure out how a compound can bind to a protein. Okay. So the database I, I've shown to you is the Chambo database, but then there are more. <clears throat> there are binding DB and also PopChem. Okay. So, so these database contain information about the compound. Let me show you again. So if I search for curcumin, I will be able to see for the curcumin drug, I mean compound, what are available data are there? And if I click on the target, I will be able to see what protein has been tested against the curcumin. Oh no. Oh, okay. So this one target is the curcuma longa. Hmm. Okay, not sure about this, why they have the, <clears throat> they have it as a target as well. Okay. Hmm, okay, interesting. Curcuma longa, curcuma sativus. Okay, so they have it as a target, but normally it's the compound. Okay. So let's say that if I'm interested in the curcumin molecule, I could click on the browse activity. And then I will get the activity here. Uh, there's more than 4,000, right? 4,000 record. And if I look at the left part, I can see the target type. And normally I like to look at the single protein. Click on the single protein because it's much more easier to investigate. And there's also the protein-protein interaction that I mentioned already. Let's say that I look at the proteins and I can see that this particular curcumin has been tested against the protein matrix, metalloprotease, and it has the IC50 of 14,000. Okay, not, not so good. But then I, I can see to the left part here, the distribution of the bioactivity. I can see that 255 or IC50. KI has 32. And so I can filter it by IC50, right? I click on the IC50. And I get to see the activity here. I could click on this, the filtering part here so that it filters from low to high. And I could see here that these compound, it's actually the same compound, right? You see the number 180239, it's the same compound. Okay, it seems to be redundant information. It has 13 nanomolar, the activity. 13 nanomolar against, this protein, arachidonid 5, the box lipoxygenase. Okay, so it's coming from a cell based format. And so this is the activity. And so it, it has pretty good activity at 13 nanomolar. But these are the type of information that we could use to build a model. Okay, so this is the Chambo database. And I, talk, I talked about the PubChem, right? You could search in Google for PubChem. <clears throat> this is what we have. <clears throat> okay, you could even draw the structure or you could type in the name or even COVID, right? Or aspirin, they give you some sample. Let's use COVID-19. <clears throat> Okay, and so they have some compounds, right? 1,600 compounds that have been tested against COVID-19. Okay, so these are some FDA approved drug, right? Ritonavir. Okay, so these databases have information about the bioactivity, okay? So these are some of the things that computers can do. I already talked about this, so I think I can skip. Right? We, we talked about briefly about self-driving car. We talked about a uh, supermarket that could, that could perform analysis of what you have purchased without even going through the, the, the line and paying for it. 
And we see here that they have transfer learning, meaning that the computer, they, have, they could use neural network in order to make sense of the art. And then they could learn the, the pattern from the art and then transfer it to an image. Okay, so you could transfer the, the image style Van Gogh into this uh, image shown an A. Okay, so it's transforming the small image into the big image that you see. Okay, so it's using transfer learning. So these are some famous piece of art from famous painters. This is an image of where deep learning has been used by Google to dream. So they use artificial neural network to dream. And so in order to figure out what could we use computational models for in drug discovery. So these are some of the example. So you, for sure, you could use it to investigate the structure activity relationship between the uh, chemical libraries. So for your collection of compounds, you want to know what structure, what structural component of the drug will give rise to a favorable inhibition of the target protein. And so the prediction model will allow you to do that. And another thing is to allow you to filter out the toxic drug. Okay, like which drug are toxic to the human body um, by, by being able to calculate the uh, properties, giving rise to admit property, like you know the ad absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. Okay. So these are some of the questions that could be used to answer um, many questions in the drug discovery field. So you might have questions such as, what target protein could your compound bind to and modulate? And would your compound bind on specifically to other protein? As I mentioned already, right, about the off-target effect and about the drug repositioning. So if it could bind to another protein, and if it provides favorable activity, you call that you know, drug repurposing or drug repositioning. So it's a way of finding a new indication, a new usage for the drug. Okay, it's kind of like if you have an Ebola drug and then you, you discovered that um, it is also effect, effective toward treating COVID-19, right? Um, I think it's the remdesivir, right? I think it's originally for uh, Ebola, right? And then they have found that it's, it's also treating um, COVID as well. Okay, so that's like the undesir that, that's, that is the desirable off-target binding, okay? But other off-target binding that is undesirable could be like when you're taking chlorpheniramine and you might feel a bit drowsy, okay? So that, that's why you cannot drive your car or um, work any um, dangerous machinery when you take the uh, chlorpheniramine. Right, because it affects your, your neural system. <clears throat> and so these are some of the things that computational chemistry has helped. Um, particularly in, the, in this example, scientists have won the Nobel Prize um, back in 1998 and in 2013. So they applied the, the concept of quantum mechanic in 1998 to investigate how quantum mechanics could be used for analyzing the, the mechanisms of compounds. Right? And in, it's used for investigating the computational biochemistry. So they use it to investigate the, the effects of the, what do you call it? The, uh, the simulation of the active sites okay, of the proteins. Like how does the catalytic triad of the enzyme work? Which residues are important? Okay. Um, this is an example overview of the broad field of computational drug discovery. And you can see here at the middle part, it is the, the various approaches. Okay, we have fragment-based, we have ligand-based, we have structure-based, and we have system-based uh, drug discovery, right? 
so I mentioned in the earlier on by drawing the image of the protein-protein interaction. So that is the red part, right? That's the system-based. And I talked about how we could use machine learning to build models. So that is latent-based. And I, I talked briefly about molecular modeling and docking. So that is structure-based, okay? So let's have a look here. So bioinformatic, um, it is a field where we're using computational approach to try to make sense of biological data. And so some of the biological data that we have include DNA, um, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrate. So these are the macromolecule of life, right? And the important thing is how do these macromolecules interact with one another, okay? So that is part of the network analysis that I've shown you um, by the drawing before. Okay, so in the field of chem informatic, it's the usage of computers, informatic approach to make sense of big chemical information, chemical libraries, right? So you could use chem informatic to try to understand what makes a drug effective. You could use chem informatic to calculate the properties of the drug. Uh, these are called molecular descriptor. Okay, so common form of molecular descriptor include molecular weight, right? And the solubility, log P, right? It's coming from the uh, partition coefficient between water and octanol. Um, it's kind of like you try to mix oil and water, and then you're going to see that you get two layers, right? And then you, your drug, is it lipophilic or is it hydrophilic? Does it solubilize in water or does it solubilize in the octanol? Okay, so every drug will have different degree of lipophilicity and hydrophilic, uh, hydrophob, uh, we call it water, um, water soluble. Okay, so drugs and its precursor. So if you imagine a drug, Let's start from the bottom. Okay, so a drug is a molecule that you know could bind to the target protein. And then the lead compound will, is normally the, the one that I mentioned to you about, the lead optimization process. Okay, it's where you take a hit compound, you convert it into a lead, and then you try to modify the structure, get a lot of analog. Okay, and then you test which analog is favorable. And out of a hundred analog, maybe one would be a favorable compound and then you use it as a drug, right? And when you use it as a drug, it means that you have to perform clinical trials on it. And so that will take a couple of years, okay? Maybe five years in the various stages of clinical trial. And I mentioned about the hits, right? The hits will be identified from a high throughput screen. So I drew a picture of the Petri, uh, of a micro titer plate, right? So you have each plate, you have the enzymes that are um, pipetted inside. And then for each well, you have different compounds, okay? And whichever compound give good activity, you call it a hit, okay? And the hit will give reasonably good activity, but not like very good. And therefore you have to take the hit and then you have to convert it into a lead and then you perform analog generation. And even before the hits, right? Um, the concept of fragment and privileged substructure um, is actually here. I drew the image here. So the number one, two, three, as you saw here, number one, number two, and number three, these are the substructure. Okay, so we call these the substructure. And then there are several papers in the literature where they try to review which substructure are favorable for the biological activity. Okay. And there are different amines. So these are amines, right? And these are like carboxylic acid. So in different types of disease, there will be a review article investigating like which substructure are favorable for a particular activity. Okay, so substructure and the privileged substructure means that a particular substructure will be important for a particular disease. Okay, like for example, a carboxylic moiety, carboxylic substructure, 
could be important for anti-cancer drugs, uh, particularly let's say for breast cancer drug. Um, another substructure for uh, anti-cancer or anti-breast cancer would have to be the ASO ring. Okay, ASO ring looks like this. Let me draw it. ASO. Okay, sorry. Right. It's kind of like an imidazole. And imidazole contains this term ASO. And normally ASO ring, it, it interacts with the FE of the heme. So the heme group, heme from aromatase. So aromatase is part of the CYP450 family, and therefore it contains the heme. And we know that the ASO ring will be able to interact. Okay, they call it the coordination. So the ASO ring from the drug can bind aromatase via heme coordination. So we call it coordination to refer to the interaction with the metal ion. And so the N here can interact with the Fe, okay? So as you see, you know, like designing a drug, it, it requires a lot of information uh, of not only the chemistry part, the chemistry part, the biology part shown here, the biology part, right? Which protein interact with which protein, how they interact, which pathway they are involved with. Um, they're also involved with the kinetics. You know, this is more into like the biochemistry, right? The kinetics, nitropo screening. Uh, also, it involves a lot about the organic chemistry, right? The structure of the compound, the location of the R group, okay? And in terms of computer, we have the generation of compounds via compound enumeration. And we also, in terms of the, uh, I think we could call this the structural biology, okay? Where you look at the protein structure and then you try to see how they interact. So I think it's better if I show you. Let me show you protein data bank. Okay, because you already have the slides and I, I'm showing you something that is not in the slide, okay? So let's say aromatase. Have you ever searched a protein data bank before? Not, not yet? Not yet. Okay, have you heard of it? Not, not no. heard of it? No, right, okay, let me show you. So this is the protein data bank and it is a database containing information about protein structure. Okay. All right, so we have already searched for aromatase. Again, the, the first one is the 3EQM. This is like a protein ID. 3EQM is the protein ID. PDB ID is the identification number. It's kind of like a barcode, okay? And it's the first published structure of the aromatase back in 2009. And so back then, I remember uh, my master's degree student, it was his project. So when the protein structure came out recently at that year, we downloaded the structure and we performed molecular dynamic. Let me click on the structure. And then we performed dynamic and then we performed molecular docking to find, to, to figure out how the drugs interact with the protein. Because at the time, it only has the androstein dion, you know, the androgen, okay? Androgen is bound inside. So androgen is the male hormone and it's converted to the estrogen, which is the female hormone. 
And so at the time, we don't know how the compounds of the drug bind to the aromatase enzyme. Therefore, we perform docking to see how the drug interact with the um, heme group of the aromatase. So let me click on the 3D view for here. 3D view. Um, there is a software that you could open on your computer called Pymo, but I think it's beyond the, the time that we're gonna cover in the course. So if you have time and you wanna use Pymo, um, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, so we're gonna just use the online version of the protein structure viewer. So this is the protein structure. This is the aromatase enzyme. So if you take a look at the structure, it looks a lot like the other enzyme of the cytochrome P450 family. Okay, so let me zoom in. And then you will see here in the color, one moment. Okay, so you can see this, right? And it will zoom in and you will see the heme group. Okay, so you see the, the one with the yellow. The yellow is the cysteine from, I mean, it's the, it's the sulfur atom from the methionine, I think. Yeah, it's a methionine. And the methionine coordinate with the Fe, which is the orange color of the heme. Okay, I might use two hands, two finger to move it a bit. Okay. And then you see the, the heme is interacting with the androsine dione right here. You see the top compound in green and with the two red in the left and the right, that is the androsine dione. Okay, and the heme is shown here at the, with the orange in the middle and the blue color atoms, they are the nitrogen from the heme group, okay? So we, we can see how the drugs interact with the heme group of the aromatase. And therefore, when we design a drug, when we analyze the, the data, we, we are more knowledgeable into what substructure are important for the inhibition. And therefore, we try to find those that have the acyl group, okay? So the acyl group is, I mentioned already, is shown here. It looks like this one. ASO. So what makes the ASO? It must contain a nitrogen and a ring. And normally it is a five member ring. It could have one or it could have two or it could have three, but it has to be connected in a different way. Okay. So these are the, the, the drugs. Let me show you. So this is the protein structure database showing the, the, the PDB. And then you could download the, the data as well, you know, like here, you could download the sequence. So this is the protein sequence. <clears throat> and then you could download the PDB and then you could visualize it on your own computer uh, using PyMo. Let me show you PyMo. PyMo is here. So they have a free educational version Okay, so you could download the free educational version. Okay, so they support window and also Mac. Okay, let me go back to the slide. Okay, so this I mentioned already, identifying the hits from hydrogen screening. And then you convert the hit to the lead. So the hit is given in the example here, fragment hits on the left part of the image. And then we convert the hit to a lead and then the lead to a more lead analog. Okay, and you, you will notice that the structure becomes bigger and bigger, right? Because the challenge is how can we add a new functionality to the molecule? We have to add a new substructure to it, right? So it, more or less the, the molecule will be grown. Okay, so it's like we're growing a molecule from a small one to a bigger one. And so if you look at the example, um, <clears throat> molecule four, it has a KD of 1340. Okay, it's not exactly IC50. Um, and then they, they measure the leakage efficiency, LE. 
right? So they, they take the bioactivity value and then they divide it by the, the size of the molecule. And then they get the ligand efficiency of 0 0.37. And in compound five, they take 2.4 micromolar and they divide it by the number of atoms, uh, also by the molecular size as well. And then they get a ligand efficiency of 0 0.31. Okay, so you see that it decreased, but then for the, the final drug, the activity became so much better and therefore the ligand efficiency is 0 0.44. Okay, but although the, the molecule becomes larger as well. And this is for the MINHA, the tuberculosis drug. So ligand efficiency is a way to take the activity value and divide it by the molecular size. Okay, to see whether you have um, improved activity as you increase the size. Okay. So you, you will see the concept here. The take home message is that when you have a hit, you convert a hit to a lead, right? And then the lead becomes an analog. The molecule will get bigger and bigger because you're trying to optimize the multiple op uh, optimization, right? Remember that we, we need to have a molecule to bind to the target, but it should also be safe. It should cross the blood band barrier. It should be having good solubility. So in order to do that, the scientists, they have to add more substructure group to it. Right? They have to add more functional group to the molecule. Okay, like let's say that for the original hit molecule, let's say that it's not soluble. So in order for it to be soluble, they have to add additional substructure to the molecule and therefore it becomes soluble. And when it becomes soluble, but it might be toxic. So they have to change the toxic atom to another one in order to be less toxic. And by changing it to a less toxic functional group, the, the size of the molecule becomes bigger. Okay, so, so you, you see the concept, right? That you, you could start out with a small molecule which gives reasonably good activity, but then you wanna optimize it to be better. You want it to have better activity. You wanna have it to be safe. So it comes at a trade-off of the size of the molecule. So the molecule becomes bigger as well, okay? So this image also shows you that from left to right, okay? From the fragment, seven asa indole to the final molecule, right? You start out with nine atoms, heavy atoms, and then you, you get the hit, right? You get 16 atoms, and then you have it to have 27 atoms. And finally, you get the final drug, and it becomes 33 heavy atoms. Okay, so in order to make it you know, more specific to the target, in order to have it have low uh, off-target binding. But in the example, third compound from the left, uh, the molecule PLX4720, you see that it has activity against 54 other kinase. Okay, so this is a kinase inhibitor. And so if you use number three, the compound three, um, PLX4720, you will also get a lot of off-target binding. So it doesn't bind specifically to the PIM1 protein, but it also binds to 54 other kinase in the same family. And so what they did in order to make it more specific is they added more functional groups to it to make it more uh, specific, right? So this is the funnel that I mentioned to you. So your, but this funnel explains a different concept. So it's essentially going from bottom up, okay? So you, you look at the bottom part, which is the fragment. You're, you're starting from less than 500 micromolar. I mean, you're, you're starting from less than, I think it's couple Dalton. Um, it might be maybe 300 Dalton. And then the size will increase to kilo Dalton, the molecule, okay? And so the activity will also have, you see that the activity becomes better and better, right? It start out with Ki of about 500 micromolar, and then it becomes better, right? Between 100, between one and 500, uh, between one micromolar and also less than one micromolar, and then up to about 10 nanomolar. So in order to be a drug, you need to have the, the Ki or the IC50 to be lower number, 
And in order to do that, you see that the molecule becomes bigger, right? And so this is the Lipinski rule five. Okay, so Lipinski rule five is very important for, uh, it's like a rule of thumb in order to, to figure out whether the molecule that you have is drug-like or not. Okay, so the drug likeness rule of five was discovered by Christopher Lipinski. So what he did was he took a data set of about 2000 orally active drug, and then he analyzed them. Okay, so these orally active drugs are FDA approved drug. And so he analyzed all of them and then he came up with a set of rule of five. And so it deals with the multiple of five, meaning that it's the molecular weight should be less than 500 Dalton. So it means that it should, shouldn't be too big. The lipophilicity or, or the solubility should be less than five. Hydrogen bond donor should be less than five and hydrogen bond acceptor should be less than 10. Okay, so this was formulated back in 1997. And then uh, the image that you see is based on a paper that we published, I think it's 2018. So if you search for it, you will find it. If you search for ER alpha and also RSC advance. Okay, so we published that. Let me show you. ER alpha, RSC advance. Yeah, so this paper, 2018, probing the origin of estrogen receptor, and it is a open access journal. So you could download the paper and read. I think it's one of the early figures here. So we analyzed the rule of five right here. Um, figure four. Okay, or maybe we didn't show it in the paper. Okay, we didn't show it in the paper. Okay. Oh, well. <clears throat> okay, so aside from the rule of five, they also have the lead light rule of three. So it is in multiple of three, like less than 300, all 10, less than three. So these are the lead molecule. So the rule of five is for a drug-like molecule. Rule of three is for a lead-like molecule. Because you know that when you go from a lead molecule to a drug molecule, the size will increase. Okay, so from 300 to 500, right? Okay, chemical space I mentioned already is, is a way to visualize all of the possible chemical compound that could exist in the universe. And if you look at the biological space, they try to visualize the biological activity and also the chemical space together. And so let's say that um, you have compounds from uh, that are able to inhibit kinase or protease. Uh, you can see the different circles in there, right? The GPCR is in green. Kinase is in the purple color, smaller one. So that, that's the region that it contain um, encompass in the biological space. So it, it's just a way, a cartoon way of visualizing how the um, protein family are related to one another. Okay, so we covered a bit about fragment space. So it's just the visualization of the, uh, the total number of compound in this 3D visualization. And so this is like the chemical space, but then we, we show it in terms of the three different type of molecule. This is just an example. Okay, so if you zoom in, you're gonna see they are having the, uh, the nitrogen, they have the oxygen, and they have the car carbocycle. Okay, so this concept I mentioned many times about how the molecule, the, the size will increase as we go from fragment to become more lead-like and it to become a final drug. So you can see that the molecular weight will become greater than 500. Okay, so that's the, the rule of five. The Lipinski rule is right here at the multiple five. The lead-like is right here at the, the rule of three. Okay, and then we go from the fragment right here. So you're gonna see that the molecule size becomes bigger and bigger. All right, and so this is the concept of polypharmacology, right? As I mentioned about the off-target binding, 
if it give favorable activity or if it get unfavorable activity, it will give rise to either becoming a side effect or becoming a, a drug repositioning or a drug repurposing. Okay, so this is the concept of polypharmacology. Okay, so the concept of, you know, that one drug will bind to one target protein, that, that is a simplistic viewpoint. So in reality, a drug doesn't bind to one protein. It could bind to multiple types of protein in the body. And if it does bind to other protein in the body, it gives rise to off-target binding and therefore it gives rise to side effects. Okay. So it depends on which off-target protein that it binds to and what effect does that give rise to uh, phenotypically, then it will give rise to that particular side effect. Kind of like if you have the chlorophenylurene, you take it and it have some neurological effect because it's a neuroactive drug. Right, so aside from being an antihistamine, it also goes probably goes through the blood brain barrier to elicit the uh, the neurological effect that it has, right? And so SCC in the in the kinase family is quite tricky because there's several hundreds of proteins in the family of kinase. And let's say for this pro, uh, this compound, uh, starosporin. As you can see here, it binds to many of the members in the kinase family. And in order to make it specific toward a single uh, subfamily of the kinase, it means that the molecule has to be bigger. Right? Because if you imagine the protein structure of the kinase, it will adopt a similar fold. And to make it bind to only a single or, or a handful of other kinase and eliminate the cross binding of the other member, it means that you have to add an additional group that will be unique to the other one. And therefore the size will be bigger. Okay, so this is the take home uh, a concept that I would like for you all of you to, to have from today about the polypharmacology, about the off target effect, about the side effects and about the repositioning of the drug. Okay, so we, we talk about this concept many times and I've drawn an illustration for you already. So we will skip this one. Okay, so we will spend some time on the QSAR. So QSAR is the quantitative structure activity relationship. And it's a way to correlate between the feature from the molecule. So the molecular feature or the structural feature of the molecule to the biological activity. Okay, so the biological activity could be the PSC50, it could be the IC50, or it could also be the KI. So you will see here in the molecule, in the, in the example here, they all look similar, but they're different. Right? If you look at here, at this position, it's a different atom. And this one, it contains a metal group added to this benzene ring. And so each molecule that you see, they're substituted with a different R group and a different position. Okay, and therefore it gives rise to different activity. And so if you could, if we could simplistically um, describe this, let me, let me make a new, equation. So the activity, the biological activity is equal to a function of the features, molecular features. <clears throat> so F is a function, right? It's kind of like you have the equation Y equal to F of X, right? And so Y is the biological activity and then X is the right so X is the features of the molecule. So the biological activity is a function of the molecular features. So if you want a better activity, you you, you need to add more or different 
molecular features to the molecule. Okay. So our exam will be take will be a open book. So you're allowed to have your. Um, I'm not sure if 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 it's permittable from. Or at least uh, you could have the printed handout of your slide, right? But because your exam is probably online, right? So I think it's okay because we're, we're, our exam is normally essay. So you have to write your understanding. So I don't mind if you have your printed version of the presentation slide uh, next to you, it's okay because you're going to have to explain your understanding. Okay, so um, I'm okay if you have your slide printed out next to you. Okay, so so we're gonna ask something very basic. You know, like you're you're gonna have to understand what they are in, in order for you to write about it. Like kind of like what's the importance of this? What what's the difference between this and this? How can you you know how can you design a drug? Can you explain the process that is necessary? Okay, so so everything is more conceptual. Um, based on your understanding of this. Okay, so I mentioned to you already that quantitative structure activity relationship, it's a way for us to investigate the relationship between the structure activity, right? So how structure give rise to activity. Um, you can see here in the numbered atoms, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. At each position, you could decide to add a BR, a bromine or a chlorine. They're both halogen atoms. You could even add iodine or you know other to, to the same family. Or you could add a methoxy group, OCH3 to position two, three, or four, right? So these are used as an example, okay? You don't have to memorize, but it's just that you could add a particular functional group to different position. And the position really depends on how does it, you know, interact with the protein in the three dimension. So let me see if I have the PyMo installed on my computer. Let's see, one moment. We have... Okay, let me, let me share my screen. You see my the screen pi more, right? Yes, I do. Get PDB. Okay, let me enter three EQM into it. And this is the aromatase. So, and then let me show the sequence. I click here, S, yes, and then I'll click on the heme. I'll give it a different color. Oh, sorry, um, I have to move the zoom icon. Um, let's see, this is, I give this a different color. Let me make it by element to be this color. Oh no, it's gone. Okay. Yellow. Show it as stick. It's shown as a yellow color, you see? And then this is the androstein dione, the androgen. I'm gonna show it in a different color. I'll show it here in the cyan color. And See, if I color this according to the secondary structure by SS, meaning the secondary structure. Okay, oh, okay, the color defaults to a different. Uh, let me color it again. I could select, okay, if I could select the, I select this thing, it becomes S E L E. I could name it, you know, I could name it to become right here to the left. I will name it to become Andrew Steen. I own, and then I'll give it a color. Let's see, what color should I give it? Uh, green. And then I'll, I'll 
click the heme group and I'll I'll call it H E and E to the left here, H C C. Enter. And now you see that I have heme and androstein diode, you know, to the menu here. And then I'll give it a different color. I'll call it, I'll give it yellow. Okay, for this one, I, I'm using the trackpad and the MacBook uh, to be better. And, and I recommend you to have a three button mouse. And then you could use the middle mouse button, the scroller to um, zoom in, zoom out. It's a bit challenging on the two, the trackpad here. You could do panning. This is panning, okay? You move from left, right. This is called panning. Uh, if you click, it's rotating. This is rotating. This is panning. And then let's see. And then we have, uh, sorry, I have uh, control and mouse. Oh no. And then I'm trying to figure out how, how this works. And then you could zoom in and zoom out. Um, I forgot how to zoom in already. Oh, like this. Okay. So on the trackpad, I just, you know, like um, pinch the screen. Okay, so I'm using the trackpad, trackpad of the computer. So it's like pinching, you know, like how you uh, use the, the tablet. You go like this and it, it zooms in zooms in and zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. Okay, and then you use shift to have this selection box, shift and then the mouse, control and mouse to see what happened, nothing happened. Out and mouse, it allows me to pan. If I, if I press the keyboard out and the mouse, it will pan it and then I will hit rotate it. And then I could pan it and then I could rotate it because it's hard to find a, an optimal you know, viewpoint of the molecule. Before I see here. Okay, so you can see that the heme is situated here. And when we visualize it, we can see how the atoms of the drug will interact. So this is the substrate. This is the androstein diode. So I need to have the actual drug docked here. So if I do molecular docking, I will be able to see how they actually inhibit here. And then I will be able to see how the residue around the, the drug interact. So let's say I, I hide everything. I show only, sorry. Um, I show the heme. Let me hide, hide everything. I show the stick, I show the molecule. So I see the heme, oh no. Okay, so I, I see the heme and I see the, the green is the, the substrate, right? The androstein dione and yellow is the heme group. I could click on the heme group and then I could say, I, I wanna show only the residue around it, around it to be about six angstrom. And I will show all of the residue around six angstrom. I show it in a line and I'll show it by elements. Let's make it like that, okay? So you can see the lines around it. They, they are the residue around the... So what about I show this as a stick? Show it as a line, okay? Now I can see. Or maybe I show it all as a line. Okay, so uh, I think you can see the concept, right, on how the residue interact with the, uh, on the ligand. Okay, so the, sometimes we, we call it interchangeably, we call it the compound, we call it as a drug, or we could call it as a ligand. Okay, so in drug design, we typically call it ligand, the compound, we call it ligand. So you might hear the term protein ligand interaction. Okay, so this is how the protein and the ligand interact. And then based on the modification, if you look at it three-dimensionally, then you can see, oh, okay, this, this functional group interact with this part and this uh, benzene ring interact with this in a pi-pi stacking interaction. 
And therefore you could figure out like which position you want to modify so that it will optimize the interaction with the residue. Okay. So this is why uh, you need to visualize and uh, perform molecular docking and modeling. Okay. So this step might take you an entire week. Okay. You rotate the molecule, play around with it, try to figure out, okay, if you modify this to be this atom, what happens? Um, actually, I want to show you more, but okay, let me, let me show you this particular atom. This is a tryptophan. I could modify this tryptophan to become something else. Let's see, wizard, um, mutagenesis, and mutation. I modify it to be a alanine. Apply. Mutate to alanine. Apply. Done. Oh, why, why doesn't it happen? Okay, I don't have the license. That's why I cannot do it. Okay, so I need to get the license. So you could modify the the residue into another amino acid of your choice as well. Okay, let's go back to the slide. Let me share the see notes. Okay. Okay, so the concept of QSAR is like here, uh, explained in three lines. So the first is you select a biological activity that you want to investigate, you want to study. And then next is to generate the description of the molecule. Okay, normally you use a uh, something like a tool from computational chemistry to calculate the molecular descriptor, to get the physical chemical description. Like what is the molecular weight? What is the solubility? Okay, so once you have the descriptor of the molecule or the feature of the molecule, then you use machine learning, okay? To try to correlate between the biological activity, uh, the IC50 that you see here with the chemical property I mean, no, correlate the biological activity or the chemical property right here. Okay, this could be actually 50 or it could be a melting temperature or it could be um, what freezing point of a molecule with the molecular descriptor. So you wanna correlate between these two parts, the blue part here, the descriptor with the activity. And in order to correlate the descriptor and activity, you need machine learning. Okay, so if you look at the illustration here, you have a set of molecule and then you want to describe it in terms of the property. You could have the energy, you could have the uh, dipole moment, you have the charge. Uh, this is the energy of the molecular orbital. So you don't have to know this in detail. So just illustration for you. So once you describe it in molecular descriptors term, then you use machine learning to correlate between the descriptor here, the blue part with the green part, the IC50. And your machine learning will be able to make a prediction. Given the following descriptor, what is the IC50? Given the following descriptor, what is the IC50? Okay. And so the most important thing about this is the interpretation of the machine learning model. Okay, so you want to interpret the machine learning model to figure out what feature are important for a good bioactivity. Okay, let, let me show you more example. So this is just a simple database search of the Scopus database to show that um, there are more and more paper being published in the field. This is interaction. This is made in the keynote. Um, okay, so it's quite outdated. So I have to update this visualization. And so this is a typical QSAR workflow. It, it might look co quite complicated. It, it comes from the paper I, I showed you just a moment ago, um, the ER alpha prediction. So let me explain to you, it's not that difficult. Chembo database is the one I shown you to you already, if you recall. And I searched for aromatase as I shown you already. I collected the data, which I shown you, there is about 2,900 compound against 5,000 activity. But about, yeah, now, now it has 5,900. 
Okay, so on this one has 10,000, okay. I'm not sure why this one has more. Um, and then I selected only IC50. Oh, okay, okay, I know now because I, I, we have only IC50. Now we have 5,900, but before, in 2017, before we published it, we had 3,500 compounds, okay? And then we did some series of filtering, we processed the data set, we removed the salts, and then therefore we get a high quality data set of about 1,300 compounds. And then we take the, the, the process data sets to use here in the modeling process. Okay, and then we perform a series of processing on the, on the data. We take the data, we calculate the descriptor, we perform feature selection. So we remove any irrelevant descriptor out. We perform data splitting. So this workflow is data science. Okay, it's about building the model. Okay, and so we perform data splitting. So you don't have to know the detail of that. Okay, so we perform 70, 30 data splits. And then we, we generated the QSTAR model and then we have the predicted activities. Okay, my daughter is going in. Okay. So, and then we have the prediction, right? And then we have to evaluate the performance, R square and Q square. And then, yeah, and then we report that in the paper. Okay. And so here are some of the applications of the QSR. And you can see that aside from drug discovery here, you could also use it for regulatory usage. Um, in order to evaluate whether the compound is toxic or hazardous. Um, another is for uh, modeling the various property of the molecule, you know, like if whether they have a particular melting point or a freezing point. Okay. This is an illustration of the bioactivity that our research group has done, but this is quite outdated. So we, we investigated various biological and chemical and protein properties. And this is a, a comparison between QSAR and proteochemometric modeling. Okay. So we have here, the difference here is like this. For a QSAR study, we have a single protein shown in blue color. And we have several molecule shown in the orange triangle. Okay, this is called QSAR, as I have taught, told you about um, throughout the lecture. And then we have this thing called proteochemometric. So the different part here is that we added additional target protein into it. So instead of having one, we have two and three. And so this is ideal if you want to study for the kinase family. Okay, let's say you have 100 members in the protein kinase family you could create a single model that will be able to simultaneously uh, make a prediction model for the various molecule and the various proteins. Okay, so this is proteochemometric. Okay, so maybe in the exam, I will ask you what, if you could compare between QSAR and the proteochemometric, okay, and provide some example, draw some illustration. Okay, so something like that, and then you could draw this and then you could try to explain how do they differ and how are they similar. Okay, so it, as you can see from the illustration, they're quite similar, right? QSAR is for a single protein, but proteochemometric is for many proteins. Okay, so this is many to one. This is many to many, okay? And therefore, if you want to investigate the off-target effects, you will use proteochemometric, right? If you wanna do, if you wanna figure out what compound could be repurposed in order to treat another uh, disease, then you could use proteochemometric modeling, okay? So in this example, um, this is the gene fluorescent protein. So I think we could skip this. This is just an example that um, I just wanna illustrate to you how we use QSAR to investigate several type of um, property. So we know that the uh, jellyfish illuminate different color Right? Sometimes it could illuminate green color. Sometimes it could illuminate red or yellow or orange, cyan color, blue color. And the color comes from the chromophore, as you see here. There are 18 different, uh, different types of chromophore. It's at the middle part. 
Okay, and the chromophore has different structure. Some have the indole group, some have the uh, hydroxy coming from the phenol, coming from the uh, phenylalanine and no, no, tyrosine, and some come from the, uh, the tryptophan, right, the indole group. Okay, so it just goes to show that different chromophore give different color. And then we build a model out of that. So we took the chromophore and we took the mutational information of the protein, and then we built a model. Okay, so nothing, nothing for you to memorize here, just to show you that we took the protein information and the compound information, and then we try to explain the color, the origin of the color. And this is just a summary of the performance of prediction, uh, which we could skip. And this is just a summary of the model performance. Okay, so summary. The summary here is okay, for the GFP paper. I think we can skip it here and you could read it. Um, Proteochemometric, I've mentioned already that we could use proteochemometric to perform drug repositioning to understand how a single, how a library of compound or ligand could bind to a library of proteins, okay? And therefore, you could use this to figure out personalized medicine, right? Because every human being have a unique uh, composition of their um, different variant of the cytochrome P450 and other proteins. So given the protein sequence information, you could generate a information about the protein and then you could create a model and then you could figure out whether the, the compound will have any side effect against your own protein. Okay, so that's the possibility of proteochemometric. Right? It considers the variability, the heterogeneity of the protein composition. Okay, so let's have a look at the conclusion. Okay, so in a nutshell, you know, there's a lot of advantages of using these type of predictive modeling, but then there are some, some pitfall that you should be aware of. Okay, so there could be the high dimensionality of the uh, input space, meaning the molecular feature. Okay, sometimes you're working with too many molecular features. Um, sometimes you're working with like, how would you represent the molecule? Which molecular descriptor would you use? Um, another would be the use of machine learning algorithm. How could you use or develop interpretable uh, models? Okay, and other could be like, what is the applicability of your model that you develop? Will it be usable after you develop it? Or will it only be good for the, the data set that you have built? Okay, so it's the long-term usage of your model. Okay, so you could do that by validating your model performance. Okay, so the second conclusion here is that in, although there are some flaws of the, the field of QSAR, but then, you know, not all technology are perfect. And therefore, if we are able to understand the limitation of the technology, we will be able to figure out a way where it is optimally used. Okay, and so I mentioned here that there's a lot of potential for QSAR and proteochemometric. And in light of the explosive, you know, high dimensional data and also the era of personalized medicine or the, um, uh, what do you call it? The omics era, there's ample data that are available. And the thing is, how can you make use of all of these data, right? The omics, there's so many omics available, right? We have genomic, proteomic, glycomic, interactomics, um, all of that could be integrated as a feature in your model. Okay, and our research group has developed some software, some web server. We developed several web servers. And then if you want to get started, I would recommend to, the thing is you don't need any fancy equipment. You just need a web browser and you could get started and using Google Colab. And software, you could use free software. So you don't have to buy anything. And programming, I recommend to use Python or R. Okay, and you could get started in computational drug discovery. And I have several examples 
uh, tutorials on my YouTube channel, which guides you from the basic um, with no background. Uh, these are all of the data and resources that I've talked about during this um, lecture. And these are just the name of the particular resources that you could have a look at. Okay, and so that's all for today. Any questions? Uh, I have one question, Kapajan. Uh, people who invent a compound during the drug discovery process, most of them is a group of scientists working outside a pharmaceutical company, right? Um, so there are, it, it really depends, both coming from our academia or coming from the pharmaceutical company. So it can come from both sides. Okay, uh, after scientists discovery a substance that was likely to be uh, effective, so they sold it to the pharmaceutical company. No, so the thing is, uh, it really depends. So if, if let's say researcher publish about something, we don't sell anything. So we just publish about it. And the pharmaceutical company, if they read it, they say it, they could, you know, they could just buy it from Sigma Aldrich. And, and the thing about selling it, it means that you need to patent it. Mm. And therefore, you see that many paper, they don't describe the structure. They don't, they don't show how the molecule looks like until they, they get the patent, right? And if they get the patent, then they publish it later. Mm. So the thing about patent is that you need to patent it first and then publish later. So if you publish, you cannot get a patent out of your published work. You okay. need to do the patent of the compound, and then you publish about that work. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one question. Uh, I'm just thinking that uh, for, for drug repurposing and um, can be done by computational approach, right? You, uh, no need to do the kind of like, oh, uh, what left? And yeah, it's kind so of drug repurposing, you could do a lot using computational approach. Um, so it's kind of like you're, you, you're making use of available data that has already been published. But then the thing is, the original researcher, they did not investigate that activity. They did not analyze it. But then you're doing a post analysis and you will find something that the original paper might not have known existed. And so, yes, you, we use the computational approach after the publication has been made to do the, the drug repurposing. And after we identify some candidate, then you know, if you have collaborators and you, you could confirm it experimentally as well. Mm -hmm. So Ajahn, uh, this one, uh, this lecture is kind of uh, new to me that uh, for, for the model of uh, designing the model and like uh, for, for us like the not, no, no background knowledge of the that, that kind of machine learning, can we be able to do the kind of designing a model like you are using kind of concept to QSAR. Right. So to design the model, I think you mean like to develop the model. Like if, okay. let's say for example, you want to use machine learning to build the model. So some of the knowledge that you would need is to have some training in um, model building, machine learning model building. Mm -hmm. And another would be to have about like the general, you know, like how do you calculate the molecular feature? So more into the bioinformatics. Yeah. So. If you're coming from a biology background, then I think it will be easier in the side of the domain knowledge that you already understand about the protein detail, about the compound detail. But in terms of the computational part, you might need to have more um, effort spent into learning about machine learning, about Python programming, or about learning the use of the various tool. And you, you might be overwhelmed because uh, there are like hundreds and even thousands of tools that are available. But the thing is, which one do you use in, in, in what sequence? Actually, we, we published a paper. It's called Maximizing Computational Tools for Drug Discovery. So out of, you know, like out of the thousands of tools that are available, which one do you use? It's right here. And it's actually summarized here. And also from that review article that I mentioned, we published in the Expert Opinion on Drug Discovery. Okay, so what database do you use it from? Here, Chembo, PubChem, BindingDB, um, Sync, GDB17, PDB, Uniprot. Um, how do you curate data? We develop our own in-house tool. We call it BioCurator. And how do you calculate the descriptor right here? Um, what tool do you use for analysis? 
of the model uh, of the data. You use R, you use Carrot, or even Parsnip. If you use Python, you use Scikit-learn, or you could also use Deep Learning by TensorFlow or PyTorch. If you want to make plots in R, you use ggplots. Um, in Python, you could use matplotlib, seaborn, altair. There's so many. Okay, so molecular modeling, you have these available. Docking, you have autodoc, doc. Molecular dynamic, you have GoMac, NMD, Amber. Okay, there's so many software. But you don't, don't get discouraged because the thing is to do it step by step. Okay, to figure out which tool is suitable for your hypothesis and then master that one by one. And so as you can see, all of these tools, you know, like over the course of what, almost 15 years at our research group, um, each paper will, will only make use of one or two tools. Maybe in one paper, we use only Chembo and Scikit-learn and uh, Matplotlib. Another paper, we might use Chembo, PubChem, Pymo, Autodoc, NAMD. Another paper, we might use Chembo, um, Babel, and Autodoc, NAMD. So, so the thing is, it depends on the paper. It doesn't mean that all paper will use all of this. Okay. Thank you, Aizan. Thank you for sharing. Right. Yeah, I have another question to, to all of you is, um, if I share this as a YouTube video, but then I will remove the image of your faces, uh, would that be okay? It might have the audio. Yes, that's fine. Yes. Okay, nice. 